get started. So, um, well, good afternoon or good morning, evening, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this HRI IAIS public dialogue on uh, regulatory challenges and supervisory demands in facilitating migrant insurance. My name is Janina Foss. I work for the Access to Insurance Initiative. And uh, yeah, it's nice to see you all on the call today. As always, this dialogue is organized in cooperation with the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, the IAIS. And I'm pleased that we have Manuela Zweimüller on the call, who is head of implementation at the IAS. And we will get back to her later in the call. In addition to the IAS, we have also partnered this time with UNCDF. So I would also give a special welcome to Premises Mukherjee, who's um, a senior financial specialist with the migration and remittance team, and also leads the migrant financial resilience work at UNCDF. So welcome Premises as well. And uh, before we dive into today's topic, I would just like to um, quickly turn to some housekeeping um, issues. Please be aware that this um, dialogue is being recorded and for sound quality, you will be muted during the call. Uh, for questions, you can either use the, the chat function or you can also later in the Q&A session, you're very welcome to raise your hand, uh, unmute yourself and ask um, any questions or make any comments. If you face any technical challenges, please don't hesitate to contact us either through the chat or through um, or via email. Um, the email address is on the screen, dialogues at hri.org. This call is also being simultaneously translated to French and to Spanish. If you wish to access the audio translation, there's a little globe icon um, on the left down side of the screen. And if you click there, you can select your language and you can also adjust um, the volume um, uh, with that little bar down there but if again you face any issues please don't hesitate to reach out to us now um as i said we have quite a full agenda today um, and i just want to give you a very brief overview of what you can expect over the next um, 70 75 minutes we will start off with an introductory presentation by william price on expanding coverage of insurance and pensions to migrants and after William's presentation, we'll have a panel discussion moderated by Manuela from the IAS, who will also introduce her panel to you later. Um, and then we will, of course, leave a bit of uh, time for Q&A after the panel discussion. So please do take note of all your questions um, along the way and, uh, and you are welcome to ask them later. To conclude the discussion, we will then turn to premises. Um, from UNCDF, who will share some reflections and um, outlooks with us at the end of the call. So now let's get started um, with the introduction to the topic for which I'd like to hand over to William Price. William is the CEO of D3P Global, where he works on regulation, investment, risk and social policy in financial services with a focus on pensions and uh, retirement income. And previously, he's been with uh, several other organizations, including the World Bank, um, the UK Pensions Regulator, IMF, UNDP, UNCDF, among others. So, um, William, welcome. Um, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Janina. And uh, thanks also to Manuela and Laura for um, the invitation. Let me just quickly do a sound check that you can hear me with fine. Um, uh, yes. Because, <laughs> great. Because I'm actually in Egypt, where yesterday I was presenting something very similar uh, to uh, countries across the MENA or the Arab region. And so it's great to be able to have another event quite so quickly on this. Um, let me go to the, yeah. So just by way of introduction, um, we're going to go through uh, this new uh, UNCDF project in terms of expanding the coverage of insurance and pensions. And I'll try and be relatively brief so that you can hear from the uh, more exciting speakers uh, a little later. But I think it's worth saying, um, uh, personally, I think it's a great thing that UNCDF have identified this project um, because it's one of, we did a different event where we were talking about, it's one of the biggest issues kind of hiding in plain sight and that when you start to think about it, and we'll go into some of the numbers in a minute, um, it, uh, you suddenly realize it's almost never discussed. 
um, and yet it's probably one of the most important areas that you could be looking at. So why do I say that and why are we looking at this issue? Um, let's go through some numbers. So if we go on the left hand side, so there are 281 million migrants in the world in 2021. Um, they support about 800 million family members back home. And they do that with about a trillion dollars in remittances, both formal and informal. Um, and if you wanted to think about that 281 million in a slightly different way, that makes them the world's fourth largest country, just, uh, just ahead of Indonesia. And yet, um, of course, they're quite a diverse group, but it's a very significant number. And if we were thinking about the pension or insurance markets in the world's fourth largest country, I think we would be uh, realizing that it's potentially very um, important. So we said that those migrants are remitting about a trillion um, and often they're working as if they are the pension provider. So if anyone, and I'm sure lots of people on this call do something similar, working abroad, sending money back to their family, maybe to their parents who maybe didn't have the right pension. Um, well, I think someone's not muted. Could, sorry, if we could just ask everyone to mute. Perfect. Um, if people sending back money to their families, to their parents, they are effectively the pension system for their parents. So as well as the one trillion, though, this money has to come from somewhere. And we estimate these migrants, that the migrant workers earn around about five and a half trillion. And that the, the focus of this work is on the insurance and pensions for those migrants themselves, as well as for their families. And so you're talking about affecting around about a billion people. We did some work on market sizing um, and we estimate around if, if you had about quarter, 25 percent of the migrant workers covered by pensions and that they were contributing relatively low sums, about five percent of their wages. Um, that over time, over 20 years, would grow to between three to five trillion. Um, and if it seems sort of uh, uh, unlikely that people could contribute five percent of their wages and that employers could match, one of the key things um, to stress is that this work is part of a broader program on remittances and improving remittances. And at the moment, when you send money home, on average, it's costing people about six percent of those of their contributions. And yet, um, you know, it should be 1% or lower. There's a UN target as part of the Sustainable Development Goals to reduce it to 3%, but already you can get well below 1% if you do it digitally. And of course, if you reduce the cost of remittances from 6% to 1%, you've created the money that a migrant could use for this longer term savings without any need actually for any additional resources. So the, the prospects here are very exciting, I think, in terms of um, what could happen. Um, I'm seeing it going to somebody's whiteboard. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else can see that. Yeah, apologies. Uh, we'll oh, it's okay. To... I'll keep on going. It's probably yeah. more exciting than my <laughs> slides anyway, so don't worry. So, so let's think a little bit about the challenges um, and there are they are significant so I'm going to go through um, just the sort of value chain if you like in a little bit so part of this story starts with gov with government and the policymakers sorry I've lost the um, oh, perfect yeah so part of this story starts at the top with government and policymakers Ideally, people would have access to social security. And so what this project is about is having public and private pensions together, um, ideally. There's a role in terms of um, the second box migrant uh, migration processing in terms of migrants are moving to a different country. They may not have very much um, financial uh, history in that country. But as they cross borders, there's a very um, specific focus on data ID permissions. And so there's a chance that you have this unique access to um, their data and ID for a period of time, which could then um, help financial providers, help government providers, and be able to kind of stitch together all of these potential bits of pensions and insurance. And then, of course, you have a financial regulator, because it's incredibly important that we don't 
solve lots of problems through clever technology, but that they are not well regulated and not safe for migrants, many of whom um, are on low incomes. And then when you get into the private sector, the insurance um, and migrant space in terms of provision, a key part, we won't talk about it a lot um, this time, is the digitization of wages. So if people are paid in cash, that's where when they remit money, it's very expensive. Whereas if the wage is paid digitally, it's then much easier to access financial services um, and to get good value. A lot of the distribution channels were thinking about how would you get workers to have, or migrant workers to have access. It could be through an employer, it could be through a remittance provider. There are many different providers where there could be a combination of a remittance provider and an insurance provider, and you see this, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, and then, of course, right at the end, it's going to the migrants of their families. So in one sense, they're the end of the value chain. Can you get um, the money to them? Can you get good products? But of course, in another sense, they're the beginning because part of the story is the demand and will it come from them? But as we'll see, actually, in terms of part of the solutions, um, it's leveraging solutions which have worked uh, for pensions and insurance in uh, home countries in developed and developing countries, and often that involves something a little more mandatory uh, than just relying on voluntary provision. So we did um, 50 uh, interviews as part of the research with um, people around the world, and I won't go through all of them, but I'm just going to spend a little bit of time going through the top 10 things which were identified as the priorities for the regulatory side, um, given the audience. And this was coming from uh, regulator supervisors themselves, as well as from people in the private sector or researchers. So number one, the top fix that kept on coming up was insurers needed to be able to operate cross-border. You've got the family in the Philippines moving to the um, United Arab Emirates. The family may have a local provider in the Philippines, but how are they then going to make sure that that provider exists um, in the UAE or elsewhere, um, and vice versa. Number two, government mandates. It's important, mandatory pensions, auto enrollment, as you've had in the UK or New Zealand or Turkey, significantly increases um, coverage. Just relying on voluntary measures won't be enough. And we see actually mandated insurance um, anyway. So um, I'll come on to an example in a second of that. Number four, the government has to be proactive here, so it's not just a market development. Number five, actually, when you're trying to market or contact um, your nationals in a foreign country, it can rapidly become incredibly complicated with um, legislation on financial promotion. But some countries have been innovative in using their embassies just to explain how you can contribute back to the home country. So if you're a Mexican working in the US, you could go to a Mexican consulate, at least in the past, and they would explain how to contribute back into the Mexican system. So you're not trying to explain the US system. Um, number six, in the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, massive migration, uh, migrant populations in their labor force up to 90%. They have very generous public pension provision for their citizens, which means there's no real history of private pension provision. But I'm at a big conference, as I said, in Egypt on this issue, and it's a developing story. Number seven, um, you know, technology is incredibly important, but as soon as you start on the tech side across financial systems and insurance and pensions, there are often multiple regulators, and you need those regulators to start collaborating, otherwise it's incredibly complicated. In the UAE, United Arab Emirates, they did a nice paper, that all of the regulators getting together with a common approach. Um, if you were in your home country, you're sitting in India and you want to pension, you get incentives from the government and there's tax relief and there's other matching payments. Migrants should have access to the same kind of incentives so that they do abroad what you would want them to do when they're at home. Um, it's interesting, number nine, there was no real discussion about World Health Organization initiatives. Um, but of course, there's a lot of discussion from the World Health Organization about how to have um, health cover for migrants. 
And then the final one, leveraging ESG environment, social and governance, um, which is getting stronger and stronger. Is it the construction company in the Middle East who may want to do for social reasons, expand provision? Is it good governance for an international garment manufacturer in Bangladesh? Is this a way that you can have um, much stronger provision? And let me just do, I'm going to skip to a final, um, final slide and then the final couple of minutes. So this is complicated. Let's just go through um, some potential interesting examples. So the first part of the project, we've been focusing on six main countries. What's some of the interesting stuff that comes out of that? So the United Arab Emirates is one of them. On the bad side, on the downside, there's no access for migrants to social security, which is, would be natural in many other countries. On the positive side, there's mandatory health cover for all migrant workers that the employer must pay. And then there's a system of um, making sure that that happens. And they now also have in the Dubai International Financial Center, the first example in the region of mandatory defined contribution pensions for migrant workers. And you probably want these pensions to be defined contribution to be asset based, because if you're going to be there for a period of one year or five or 10, but you don't know for certain, a defined benefit system may be more difficult to work in terms of um, the incentives and the transferability. Um, countries like India have and Mexico have already fixed the sort of IT approach so that you can be living abroad you can use a remittance app and you can contribute directly into your home pension system. So we want some things in the host country, the Gulf country, for example, where they can offer um, provision. You want something where the home country can give you access to your home system. And what we see is obviously there's a big patchwork here because, you know, an Indian migrant has a biometric ID and an individual private pension system, which is well regulated. And so there's the chance to contribute back home. The same doesn't exist of a Sri Lankan migrant. And so you may have two workers side by side on a construction site, and you may need to have different solutions. All of this means that there's a very high priority on very slick, effective, automatic, functioning IT, but with strong regulation. And so let me just, in the final uh, couple of seconds, we did, there's a bunch of things as a sort of simple overall brochure, if people wanted to kind of few uh, few pages insight but then there are three question uh, sorry three papers that written with them um, premises uh, and they talk about the current situation the case for change and the shape of potential solutions there are links in this I'm, I'm assuming the slides will go around to people click the links you can go to the papers um, and now sort of really interested to hear from the discussion and from the people on the call because the great thing so far working with UNCDF on this is they're very open-minded in terms of what will work and they're very focused on being able to work with the private sector as well in terms of having innovative pilots. So I'll, I'll sign off here and um, look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, William, for setting the stage uh, for our panel discussion that is now to, to follow. Um, so I will pass over now to Manuela Zweimela, who will be uh, moderating the panel discussion and who will introduce again our speakers um, for that panel. So Manuela, over to you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. yes. Okay, yes, thank you. Well. Excellent, that's perfect. It seems my connection is now stable. No, William, thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure, yeah, also to meet you virtually uh, after our in-person meeting a couple of months ago. And I have also seen that you have much advanced, yeah, in the project and, and, and got additional uh, insight. That's, uh, that's fantastic. And I think it will add a lot uh, to the course of remittance uh, linked insurance. Thank you so much. On the panel, we have uh, three very renowned uh, uh, panelists. So I will start with uh, Garance uh, Vati Richard. So she is the CEO of AXA Emerging Customers, uh, a business that she founded in 2016 and that aims to protect the underserved populations across different income levels and markets. So that's a very exciting uh, business that you have really yeah, started from, from the ground. And Gorance has also been working for, for AXA in a variety of capabilities, 
uh, and among other initiatives, uh, she also launched the She for Shield report in partnership with the IFC and Accenture. She previously worked for strategy consultancies and multilateral organizations and is also the winner of the first Women in Insurance Award of the Geneva Association. So uh, congratulations to this as well. I know it's a couple of years ago, but uh, it's uh, fantastic. And a uh, World Economic Forum Schwab Foundation Innova Innovation Awardee. So we are very happy to have you with us. Uh, with this, I move to Jeremy Leach. Um, so he has been involved, uh, involved in advising, researching and implementing digital finance services across emerging markets. And you have heard from William how important this digital channel and distribution, digital distribution channel is, um, and also yeah, to get the money across border. So we are very happy uh, to have here uh, 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 an excellent uh, expert uh, for the panel. He is, uh, Jeremy is now the founder and executive director of Inclusivity Solutions and Inclusive InsurTech. So I think the name says it all. Um, and um, he is definitely operating in uh, yeah, digital insurance business in emerging markets. So I think we can learn a lot from Jeremy's experience. Um, he has worked in the public and the private sector. And uh, he's also a founding member and advisor to Sentry. Uh, century and served the South African Minister of Finance's uh, short-term advisory committee, amongst other um, roles that he held. So a fantastic addition uh, to the panel. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for your time. And last but not least, Brian Gail Subian. Uh, so he is the division manager of the Regulation Enforcement and Prosecution Division of the Insurance Commission of the Philippines. So it's uh, fantastic uh, that we have um, yeah, also the, the insurance angle covered here uh, and have a representative uh, of the uh, insurance supervisor uh, on the panel. Uh, Brian is a member of various committees and technical working groups, uh, including the Committee on Compulsory Overseas Filipino Workers Insurance. I think uh, today you really you have uh, the best uh, uh, speakers on this topic of remittance linked insurances. So a very warm welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, and just uh, from my side to, to, to emphasize the importance of this topic. Um, so you mentioned uh, uh, Janina and also William. Uh, yeah, migrants are a very sizable group. Uh, remittances they send are of great importance to their families at home. I don't think we need to re-emphasize this, uh, it's, it's a fact. And it's really supporting their livelihoods and even substituting insurance and pensions when these are lacking, for example. So it's, uh, it has a, a huge impact uh, on, on their lives and, and their well-being. They face specific risks and we have heard uh, also uh, from, from William um, and uh, yeah, they expose not only themselves but also their families at home when they go abroad to work uh, to, uh, to, to quite some vulnerabilities. Uh, so migration uh, adds uh, some unique cross-border elements uh, to the expanding insurance coverage. And I think that is really key, this cross-border element, and this needs to be yeah, somehow solved. And I'm very pleased uh, to have a panel where I can uh, focus on, um, yeah, where we can focus on regulatory product development and the distribution challenges uh, talking about when we talk about remittance linked insurance. With this, we have 45 minutes left for the panel, 40 minutes left for the panel. I come in um, to the first round of questions. So we have a couple of rounds of questions, three rounds overall. And at the end of the panel, William, uh, we will also get back to William and ask him uh, also um, whether he has some uh, views to add or some comments to make. So that's the setup. And with this, Jeremy, may I ask you the first question? So uh, this is about, so you work on remittance linked insurance in Africa. Could you briefly tell us about the project inclusivity solutions that you are working on and how do you adapt insurance products to the migrants needs? Jeremy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate the invitation to join you here today. Um, so on the first question in terms of inclusivity solutions, we're an insurtech, an emerging market insurtech based in South Africa, um, 
primarily under my wife's orders, uh, but basically operating kind of globally uh, now alive in kind of six countries in Africa, three more should be added by the end of the year, and also looking to move into kind of the Asia, Asia markets. We provide the, um, obviously being in SureTech, we provide the platform, which is end-to-end -end support sign up right through to kind of claims kind of processing, et cetera. Beyond that, we've also realized that there is probably insufficient skills and understanding in the market around these type of products, which I think is also the, uh, the rationale for this session. So we've also invested in invested in kind of market research, product development and pricing with our actuaries, um, support a lot of experimentation around customer experience and data analytics as well. So really provide that full support end to end for our partners, which are typically the distribution partners and the insurers kind of on, on the ground. In terms of the adapting products to, to migrants, I guess we, there's a couple of things. In one, we've invested heavily in human-centered design research. So we engage with the end kind of customers, the migrants, understand their needs, um, understand the, the risk that they face, and then design products around those needs. So that's, and we've done that, I think, in over a dozen countries kind of so, so far. And um, so I think that is pretty cool, really understanding the needs of the customers, understand the risk, how do they engage. But ultimately, the ultimately, it's about testing. If you look at behavioral economics, so, you know, it always teaches you don't just uh, listen to what they say, look at how they behave. So beyond the uh, doing the research, you, we need to get to market and test with the product to see how they respond to the product and, and the design kind of around that. I, I could go on for a very long time, but I know there's a, quite a lot to cover, but that's essentially give you that gist is understanding the needs, look at the data, and then we experiment by getting to market and testing response rates in the market. That's excellent. No, thank you so much. And in particular, I think the, yeah, understanding the needs, I think that's very important uh, because I think needs of migrants are different yeah, because they are really going cross-border, they leave the families at home. So their needs are different from yeah, policyholders that, uh, that are really yeah, more domestically served. Yeah. Uh, with one, this, maybe just one interesting yeah. kind of anecdote on this is, and we've also found the research around the behavior is different from migrants from Europe. Yeah. to Africa compared to migration within Africa. So we've often seen, I think we saw earlier, a lot of the migrants are sending money home to family from, say, Europe. But actually within Africa, a lot of the migrants' migration is not as simple as that. So you look at the money transfers, we see a fair chunk of the money is actually supporting businesses. So it's more around using remittance channels to support cross-border trade, not just around kind mm -hmm. of um, family transfers, which again is interesting if you're trying to design simple products for a certain segment of the market, you actually need to differentiate between what is the purpose of those kind of transfers. No, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you for this addition, uh, Jeremy. I think it was uh, uh, really very good. Uh, with this, I uh, move to uh, Garance. Um, Garance, if you could briefly outline uh, what, what AXA has been doing in the context of remittance-linked uh, or migrant uh, insurance so far. And uh, yeah, you are well placed uh, also with uh, as the CEO of AXA Emerging Customers. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Um, I mean, we've we've done a a, a variety of uh, we've put together a variety of projects um, to tell you that they were the easiest ones, or the easiest ones would be to lie. Uh, they are they are complex and. What I was thinking when I was when I was preparing today um, was that it could be useful in, instead of going into the detail of each project because you know ultimately uh, we've insured over the last couple of years cumulatively two hundred thousand migrant workers, which is not a lot, right? Um, uh, over a few projects, uh, the strategy is based on as has been mentioned several times, and I really like. Uh, what, what Jeremy said in terms of behavioral economics, and it, it very much depends on not only what they need, but how they envisage risk and, and, and how they envisage uh, uh, dealing with it, right? But so our, our strategy is twofold, as it's been said today, we haven't invented the wheel or reinvented it. It's both securing transfers, so ensuring the migrant in, in the host country and sequentially or simultaneously looking to protect the families and if I mean, what Jeremy just said on businesses is really interested and and their businesses, let's say, um, in, in the home country. So ensuring the remittance receivers in the home country. And so far we've looked at quite commoditized or basic insurance products linked to life, linked to, linked to health, linked to personal accident, etc. So, I mean, 
I won't go in right now into the detail of that because what I thought was maybe more interesting was what were the challenges uh, that we had come across. But so I don't know if that's a question you want to ask me later or if you yes. want me to yes. sort of the challenges. <laughs> no, we will come to the uh, challenges in the first, in the second round, uh, if uh, if you allow. Uh, that would be great. No, okay. I also found the link. Uh, now, first of all, it's uh, thank you. It's it's really great uh, to to get a bit of a feeling about the other numbers. The numbers are low. You said two hundred thousand migrant workers. This is not much, to be very honest. And then also to focus really on those two uh, parts uh, on yeah. Uh, the, the home uh, where also the family is placed and then kind of the host country and what they need in the host country. And uh, what Jeremy brought in for the businesses, I, I immediately thought about small and medium sized businesses and commercial. Uh, so they could be also interested, uh, interesting from, uh, from an insurance uh, coverage perspective. But with this, Brian, uh, I would like you to come in. Uh, and uh, yes, the Insurance Commission in the Philippines has been working on the topic of migrant insurance for quite a while. So you have a lot of experience also uh, how you address this. And could you please share some of your insights uh, as a supervisor um, with us uh, on the Philippines migrant insurance work? And what is the role of the Insurance Commission uh, in this scheme? Um, first of all, thank you for inviting us for, for giving us this opportunity to perhaps more or less or showcase what the Philippines have in so far as um, insurance protection that we afford for our beloved migrant workers. Um, as a brief history, um, we have a law way back uh, year 2010 when Republic Act number 1022 took into effect. This is intended to provoke um, improve the standard of uh, protection and promotion of the welfare of the migrant workers. One of the salient features of which is the provision for the compulsory insurance for agency hired Filipino workers. Without such insurance, agency hired OFWs will not be allowed to depart for the country of destination where they are about to render their services. Among the benefits provided under such insurance are natural death, accidental death, repatriation of mortal remains, permanent disablement, medical evacuation, subsistence allowance in case of a pending litigation, compassionate visit, and many claims, money claims in case of unlawful dismissal. Let me note that the cost of the premium payment for such coverage is not shouldered by the migrant worker, but by the employer. While the benefits to, provide, to be provided under the OFW insurance is not commensurate to the hardships our migrant workers encounter day in and day out, it will nevertheless provide them sufficient assistance in their most trying times. So far as the regulatory challenges, uh, we have noted that during the um, couple of years that we have been implementing this, there would seem to be um, some benefits which are still lacking. One of these is the um, coverage for repatriation in case of civil war, natural calamities, or pandemic. And then the coverage for permanent disablement arising from psychological uh, cases. And then the um, health insurance, because uh, Health insurance is more or less um, subjective in so far as each particular... Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Can, can we mute them, uh, Janina? <laughs> Please. Yep. <laughs> you someone is having breakfast or <laughs> we should be fine now so Sorry, okay can i continue apologies yeah brian really apologies so we we, we try to mo uh, mute everyone so please continue so you were just uh, uh telling us on the uh the health insurance and the challenges okay. yeah so basically, the health insurance is uh, 
perhaps one of the most important aspect of providing coverage for our migrant workers. But um, this is subject to different challenges, considering that um, we have to balance the interest, interest between the host country, the concern of the host countries, as well as the concern that we need to address in so far as providing protection for our um, migrant workers. Sometimes this could be a deal breaker, considering that uh, if this will this will entail a lot of uh, cost uh, perhaps some host countries would prefer to simply um, look for other uh, countries who, which could offer or provide the migrant workers that they need thank you thank you thank you brian uh, this this was really great because uh, i understood that more or less the point of departure is the agency that more or less is, uh, yeah, uh, helping to get uh, uh, employment uh, abroad uh, from the Philippines. That I think that's a very good uh, hook uh, where you can link uh, also, yeah, uh, obligatory, and you said it's mandatory insurance too, uh, even if there are still some areas that need to be covered. So thank you so much for this very uh, exciting uh, first uh, round um, of questions. So we were uh, focusing on examples uh, for, for products, for projects, uh, and I think we heard uh, quite some interesting uh, insights from yeah, commercial business to uh, the agency uh, to uh, also yeah, that uh, learning the projects are complex and that I can imagine. The next round, then I will start with Garance and then go to Jeremy and Brian. Uh, you will be uh, the third uh, panelist. It's about challenges. So we have already addressed a little bit challenges uh, and the delivery uh, of, of the product. So, Garance, uh, I uh, come to you first. So, what have been some of the implementation challenges uh, that you have faced and you have started to, to uh, tell us already a little bit about it? And relating to the Philippine scheme that Brian introduced, do you see any challenges when it comes to mandatory insurance schemes uh, with regards to yeah, remittance-linked insurance? Yeah, so... The Thank you for your question. The, the challenges are kind of, it, it was part of the discussion we had to prepare, right? They're linked, obviously, to regulation very much, right? I think well, probably it's the, it's the hardest and the, the, the area where we need to, to move the most, right? Um, to the product, uh, which was touched upon uh, by my fellow panelists, and to the delivery. Uh, so, I don't know. Is just to understand your your third round of questions will be on regulations. So, would you like me to answer more on delivery and product, or yes. in the Philippines? Yes, please, please. We understand the the, the major challenge is regulation, and uh... so you want to go there last. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, we will go there last. <laughs> Thank uh, <okay>. you. <laughs> So, I mean, it was touched upon already, but I would say that, you know, I haven't reinvented the wheel. Um, with regards to products, I think I'm I'm not going to surprise anyone to say that they need they really need to be simple. And uh, when we look at the OFW insurance scheme in the Philippines, which honestly is a, is is best, I mean, is a first mover, uh, has taken a lot of risks, has put in place agencies, et cetera. And with regards to agency, I think they've been very careful, but we know there's a, there's a danger there, right? Uh, for agency to be too strong an intermediary, et cetera. But if I go back to the product, uh, the OFW insurance scheme is a great scheme, but it has multiple covers, right? It has many benefits and it's quite difficult actually. I mean, it's, it's, it's positive element is that it starts from the home to the host and that's quite rare and that's, that's quite essential, but it's, it's got various benefits and it's actually quite difficult uh, because we've, we've done focus groups. It's quite difficult for the migrants to actually understand what they're eligible for. Um, and we've done a couple of products, for example, with merchant trade in, in Malaysia. And we also made that mistake, right? It's it, because it's got, you had too many riders. So in terms of the point of sale, it makes it very difficult for more uneducated, at least from a financial literacy point of view, uneducated MTO or money transfer operator frontline staff to sell quite complex products. So just, we're really, trying to push for extreme simplicity, so term life, for example, or hospital cash, as was said, and then to use that opportunity to cross sell. Uh, this is also true in terms of the amount being covered. Uh, a lot of, uh, when you think about the mandatory 
element in UAE, for example, it's it's for quite high uh, high premiums, and so ultimately it's the migrant that's going to pay. Uh, the employer is asked to pay for part of it because it's very high. They find ways around it, um, and we've come to the conclusion because we haven't abandoned at all. We're just really trying to learn, and I think for for example, what what Jeremy said, etc., would be is going to be very helpful for us. But it should be about providing living benefits, right? So, for example, most of our claims in Malaysia, I remember, um, and, I, and I was reading on the project this weekend to, to prepare for today's panel, were, were, very, were basically 90% were about temporary disability cover. So it's living benefits, so like sick leave insurance. Because if they're unable to work, they can't send money home, right? So the idea there was to, for every five days of their sick leave, to get a small amount, I think it was a, between 20 or 30 euros. It sounds small, but the migrants in Malaysia who are Bangladeshi, who are Indonesian, who are Filipinos, they were getting, they get no pay once they don't work one day, right? So it's, it sounds simple and like I'm opening open doors, as we say in French, but there are not that many products that are that, that simple. Then obviously, if you look at, so this is a corridor, uh, let's say emerging to emerging. Right, let's say from Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, Indonesia to Malaysia. But if we look at corridors from more from from countries like Europe or the UAE, for example, yes, in those countries they have health insurance. There's mandatory health insurance, as uh, uh, William was saying in in the beginning. They're covered by so local social securities. But there are lots of countries where there is no health insurance. And they're not paid where they're sick. So that's a really it's a living benefit, right? A focus on living benefit. Um, and I don't want to go into the detail now, but I, I, I do think at one point needs to be discussed the issue of women and, uh, in particular, everything linked to female migrants that, um, that has not been taken into account. And I know a few of them, of the reports, be it from the ILO, be it from Centfree, uh, be it from the I2AA do concentrate on the difference in situations, um, for female migrants. So. We could go on. I'd rather get questions on everything linked to, to to the product. And just to finish, in terms of challenges with regards to delivery, um, regulations. We can talk about it later. That's one point. But it's really about what the the the, the challenges we've been faced with is, and we're not the first to talk about it. We're talking about we've been talking about this agenda for decades. It's the safe, the safest way is to be as clear as possible and to stop introducing new difficulties. I mean, the types of discussions that we've had on KYC on the extent to which we need to protect migrants to protect them against giving too much of their data, not knowing where their data is being stored, how it's going to be given. I mean, you know, let's do that once it's easy to set to attach pensions or to push pension people to have pension products or insurance is done but if we can just even just start with two things have a checklist of what it is that the insured should know because we get a lot of pushback and a lot of difficulties linked to data right and to and to kyc so what is covered five things what is covered who is the beneficiary and for them to have a choice on who that should be not necessarily the husband, by the way, for female migrants, how to claim, how much do I pay, and how is my data going to be used? That's it. And just on the final point, and that's where, again, I think Jeremy's inclusivity solutions is key, is that the delivery should be allowed by, by multiple providers, right? Because, I mean, such as FinTechs or like Jeremy or Rise, et cetera, because MTOs, our experience with them has been that the change is huge for them to go to cross sell. Their, their core business is transferring money. And so everything that goes beyond that is very difficult. The, the incentives are not right. The understanding of the product is not right. So if there is a mandatory to finish uh, approach, which I really think is the right approach and that's been, that's been um, mentioned several times, it needs to include more of these other players that actually know how to attach and how to bundle these services because MTOs, it's it's honestly it's very very difficult to get them to attach it to to what they do as a core business. 
Okay. No, thank you. Thank you, Garance. Very clear, very practical. And I must also say, when I listen to you about your checklist, uh, I must say this is also something that we can definitely make use of uh, for yeah um, developed countries. Yeah, it's not only for remittance linked insurance and for developing countries. <laughs> so it needs to be simple and clear. Yeah, definitely. Uh, with this, I would like to go uh, to uh, Jeremy um, and ask you also about the implementation challenges. So um, we know from uh, different discussions also in, in, in the IIS A2I Financial Inclusion Forum that in inclusive insurance context, it's really all about uh, or a lot about product delivery. So uh, we have spent already several sessions on this. And we have also learned that digitalization uh, can definitely bring uh, yeah, relief, but could also bring new risks. So uh, my question would be, uh, yeah, implementation challenges uh, in the context of inclusive insurance on product delivery, if you could let us know a little bit from your experience and what advantages does digitalization bring in the context of remittance link insurance? And here, I think you have a lot of experience that you can share with us. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for that. Yeah, I certainly kind of um, agree about what Karen was kind of saying kind of earlier. And yeah, I think your point around digitization is interesting. So, I mean, I think COVID drove a massive shift towards digitization. I and mean, just ironically, we were actually engaging with a money transfer operator that was primarily focused around um, cash. I kind of, uh, I think it was um, probably two years ago, maybe two, yeah, yeah but 20, mid early 2021, I think it was. And their main focus was around trying to drive kind of market share, particularly around the kind of cash-based model, but still focusing around cash as the dominant mechanism. You dial that forward a year, and their whole business had transformed. They'd moved from a primary cash business to a digital model because of COVID. And that's a huge transformation, which they were kind of grappling with and now trying to work out how, how they kind of operate in that space. So I guess it is an interesting, uh, that has been a shift. And I think companies are still grappling around that. We'll, we'll I'd like to cover that a bit more in a second. The second point around the, the payment side, I mean, we talk about um, frictionless payments being the key to inclusive insurance. If you can't get recurring payments kind of going well, you're not going to be able to get a viable business. We've proven without a doubt that push payments when it's purely on insurance, when you initiate the payment yourself on a monthly basis, that doesn't work. It works very well for electricity, airtime, and remittances, because if you don't pay and pay that, well, we have so much load shedding here, that's not such an issue, but if you don't pay your electricity, I'll be cooking in the dark because my wife is extremely upset at me. So there's immediate repercussion if you don't pay. That's not the same of insurance. And so what's exciting about the remittance and insurance space is you're linking into insurance into another product or service, which is highly valued in the market, and that's important. But we've also learned, and if you look at behavioral economics and the example from the US, they see the biggest driver of contributions towards retirement savings in the US is not around financial education. It's a default. It's that the opt-out model, that you automatically contribute to pensions as part of your employment contract, unless you opt out. That's pretty scary, isn't it? This is a very sophisticated market in the US. And the bigger driver is not about an education, educating the pop, uh, populace. It's around a default kind of um, action around that. So again, it just makes it even more tricky in markets where the understanding of insurance is even more limited and also a regulatory kind of question you need to ask around those kind of uh, those opt out models. So that payment issue is going to be is a critical kind of aspect, both in terms of how do you ensure valuable products, as we're hearing from the Philippines, as well as effective kind of a contribution towards the payment side. On the tech a tech aspect, yeah, I, I agree. I think of Garant's. I think there's a real challenge. A lot of money transfer operators, you know, they're shifting to digital. But the reality is a lot of their systems are legacy-based platforms. They're really slow. So to be able to get changes to the user interface, you know, how you sign up, it's often like a six-month process as they put it into the queue um, on that area. So there's a capacity there. And secondly, it's also around, um, you know, the seamless sign-up. At the end of the day, for insurance to work it needs to be really seamless and really easy you sign up and you pay pretty much in one in one go without intervention and again that challenge of the capacity of the partners has been problematic so we're very agile on our dev side we have our own proprietary platform we built ourselves and incredibly quick we've opened apis so anybody can sign up within kind of actually within hours um we've had one partner signed up two products in an hour so that's really quick from our side but when your partners in the money transfer operators in this case 
and they have old kind of systems, it's really tough to ensure that type of sign-up process. So that is a major issue about seeing the sign-ups and not having kind of complicated multiple menus um, or, or playing around. The aspect around design of products, again, we, we've heard this as a lot about whether it's for the consumer, whether it's specifically for women, understanding how do you tailor it to their needs? How do you communicate to them effectively? Because if you don't communicate well, we know that the claims are going to be close to zero or, or nil. And unfortunately, there's many cases of very low or products of very low claims ratios. So again, we spend a lot of our time thinking through how to design products that match their needs, meet their requirements and communicate effectively through gamification models to drive kind of um, to drive uptake. And again, that importance of communicating and engaging is important for um, clients to understand the need to, I guess, change your behavior in a more positive way and obviously also drive kind of claims. So we've been quite excited that on, at least this is one loyalty model, we saw that there was a 19% increase in transactions because of, the, because of insurance and a, over, overall sign up of new customers because of it over 100% in one kind of uh, one kind of partner. So again, we've seen those significant changes if done well, but it's really tough as we're hearing because of the challenges of, of the partner uh, being able to kind of implement things effectively, their technical aspect, even the understand of their customers is relatively limited. So even when we're trying to work with the partners to understand how to segment their base, actually their knowledge of that base is limited to some basic KYC kind of rules. So it's again, pretty pretty hard to then kind of segment effectively and communicate, uh, communicate effectively. So I'll just try to cover a few of the areas and Garant's covered them as well. The issues around the kind of the payment side, which is critical, uh, the technical kind of aspect around um, ensuring a seamless kind of sign up and again, product design, which is so critical, but um, is sometimes challenging to do well in these kind of contexts. Okay, thank you, thank you. That's, we've ignored uh, that's regulation <laughs> as ordered. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's good to know, Brian. Uh, you as a third speaker. Before we go to a very quick third round, uh, please take the floor and also let us know in particular where you see the challenges uh, on cross-border delivery for data and financial flows um, and consumer protection, because that was mentioned by Garance uh, at the beginning that this is really an issue. And how should supervisors balance flexibility to enable much needed market expansion, but in a safe way? I, I think we really need to, to find a balance here and uh, cannot expose the consumers uh, yeah, extensively. But as a regulator, we also have uh, the role to um, for fair, fair customer treatment and uh, safe markets. Brian, please. Okay. Um... On our end, um, insofar as the delivery is concerned of the services involving insurance, our labor offices stationed in different parts of the world serve as a coordinator regarding concerns of our migrant workers. Concerns, if any, are then coordinated by these labor offices to its home office in the Philippines. If it concerns compulsory um, um, uh, the implementation of the compl compulsory overseas insurance, the recruitment entities are primarily tasked and required to coordinate with accredited insurance providers for purposes of taking appropriate actions. Let me also note that the accredited insurance providers are required to have an arrangement with assistance providers so that they are readily available once the need arises. On another road, another note, um, with the technology technological advancements and disruptive innovations that we are experiencing right now, we might as well take advantage of these facilities for purposes of advancing the welfare of our migrant workers. In our country and um, specific to insurance, um, we have issued several guidelines in so far as sandboxing is concerned. Personally, this can be used as an effective tool in testing the efficacy of a certain measure. With this, uh, regulators can closely monitor the progress or development of such mechanism and issue appropriate and timely guidelines as the need arises in a prudent manner. Another important factor that should also be taken into consideration. Sorry, I think. Uh... Yes. Can go ahead, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. As I, as I was saying a while ago, and uh, as I've also discussed, 
another important factor that should also be taken into consideration is the cost involved in every proposed measure that we seek to implement. Proper balancing of interest is of um, primary importance in order to provide an environment where benefits and services afforded to migrant workers are optimized while providing at the same time a conducive environment on the side of those who would like to engage or provide services to address the migrant workers industry. In so far as the development on, some, on products, uh, I guess uh, the objective of the proposed measures that we are currently have um, having right now is that um, the objective is to pro afford protection for uh, afford equal protection for both uh, men and women. Um, we do acknowledge that uh, there should be gender sensitivity based programs in order to cater the needs of migrant workers, especially on the part of the women uh, migrant workers. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's something that we can uh, put in the pipeline, considering that various advocacy groups and various dialogues, include, such as this, are very vocal towards uh, affording protection to our women migrant workers. So I guess it's something that will happen sooner than later. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Brian. With this, we can conclude the second round uh, on the on the challenges. And for yeah, the regulation and role of the uh, supervisor, I would really like uh, to ask you to have a very quick round because we also need some time for, for Q&A from the audience. So that would be great. So I will address myself first to Jeremy. So yeah, it's about regulatory barriers and uh, opportunities. So um, and yeah, if you could uh, be concise, please. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to repeat the others, but I think there's going to be a few things that kind of come out. We've said around the, the KYC data. I mean, just a nice example in in South Africa, where you're seeing money transfer operators being able to transfer monies overseas, and they're relatively relaxed around. Um, <clears throat> not that you should say that probably about you know those who are migrants who may not necessarily have all the papers. But insurance, you in South Africa law, you have to have an ID card. An ID card has been to, to, to either be to basically be allowed to work here. So again, you know, can we be more relaxed and say focus more around you know proof of identity, which could be more loosely defined rather than necessarily have um, insurers as the outsourced home affairs kind of um, obviously in the South African space. So I think the KYC um, is an aspect around again making it as simple and uh, suitable for the particular markets. Um, I guess the issues around um, you know. Data protection and such like has come up a few times, not necessarily about money transfers, but we've got an example where in Rwanda we were forced to deploy our servers locally because no mobile subscriber data was allowed to move, um, uh, host their data overseas. And actually, we're doing a money transfer of MTN, trans where who are doing um, supporting transfers to other countries. But again, because of the rules, you cannot use cloud based platforms. So essentially undermining the cost um, kind of yeah. fintechs who obviously want to use new um, modern kind of cloud-based kind of systems and yet they're being forced to deploy locally with the impact on servicing and aspect. I think an overall thing, um, and a bit odd for me to say, but I think there is a risk around this whole embedded insurance or kind of model around uh, creating mis-sellings because again, the whole point around embedded insurance, which is actually an old model reinforced is around linking insurance to other products and services. But unless you communicate well, and help clients understand the customers, there's a danger that there is mis-selling and there's also kind of no claims as well. So I think a lot of it, what we spend a lot of our time on is designing products so it's easy to sign up and you communicate regularly and easily and have the ability for them to kind of opt out. So again, we just need to think through how do you balance those interests between ensuring maybe that default option, which we heard from the Philippines um, being important, as well as the, the need to communicate effectively with your client base so they understand the benefits of insurance and do actively yeah. kind of um, claim. No, oh, thank you. Go thank on. you so much, uh, Jeremy. I go quickly to Garance. So here it's really, um, uh, you already mentioned data uh, as a kind of a regulatory barrier, but is there something where you see uh, a regulation uh, in uh, yeah, providing uh, or improving risk protection for migrants? There are a lot, but just to focus very quickly, I would say the, 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 the most difficulties are for the migrants at, at firm, for the families at home or the businesses at home. So the biggest regulatory challenges 
are not linked to the remittance sender. There are some, right? So, for example, that money transfer operators usually don't have the right license, right, to sell insurance. Or even if they get the license to embed insurance, to, to, to Jeremy's point, in remittances, uh, it, it remains a, a, a real challenge, right? So, in Europe, for example, because the regulation for ancillary intermediation is clear and, uh, and our partners didn't really have any issues there. In a place like Malaysia, Bank Negara has been very, very agile. So they've granted mm. a, a waiver uh, to their remittance companies. But but if you look at the Gulf, right, which is the bulk, if I understand correctly, and I'm not a big specialist in remittances, but it is the bulk of where there are a lot of uh, of migrants, right? The, pa the path is not that clear. Uh, the path to get the license validated for MTOs is tricky. They are, and this is new to a lot of money transfer operators, right? So yes. sometimes, I think, Jeremy, you 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 were pointing to that also in terms of the order of priority of things, then they drop it because it's it it, it has this the influencing of regulators is is complicated and in a way paradoxically, uh, what I was pointing to before when you have a non financial distribution partner, so a la intermediary, a la rise, etc., then it's it's easier because they're not under the central bank type of regulations, right? And so for the host jurisdictions. Um, the other regulatory challenge is that you don't have simplified rules on who can sell simple micro insurance products, which you do have right in, in emerging in the emerging world. There are very often micro insurance guidelines, not the case in the more mature countries. Uh, so they're adapted to bank insurance agents who are used to selling more complex insurance. So it's, it's hard to make the physical sales model work uh, because a lot of the MTO frontline staff uh, just. They, they don't, the branch setup doesn't comply or it's too expensive to make it work. But to me, the, the biggest, and I'll finish on this, the biggest regulatory challenges are for the people at home, right? Often we know that home insurers are not admitted to the host country market. Yeah, it's right? So they can't really sell the family insurance <laughs> to the migrants. Um, and this is, has been the main issue that's made very, even strong local micro insurance player, players fail to provide insurance to family members. And we know it's not new. I think I read a, a report not long ago, actually preparing for this, which was a 2010 report that's also, uh, that's already uh, broached this topic. Um, it, it's hard for, for multinationals like AXA, it's quite hard for us to get our compliance teams to take the risk with local regulators yes. <laughs> for a small, relatively small revenue, right? So so that's a, that's that's a key one. And then, the second one, and I'll finish with this, I know we're in a rush, but it's, it's quite important is that money transfer operators, we rarely have legal entities in the home countries, right? Therefore, they, they can't be group policyholders. It's, it sounds like a detail, but it, it, yeah. it's so much easier and more efficient and, yeah. and lower cost to administer low ticket policies through go group contracts, right? Absolutely. And then just finally, collecting premiums from abroad by home country insurers is not possible or it's a gray area right with regards to compliance so of course this is not the case in online sales but to tackle it probably there's something along the lines of a broker getting a broker to intermediate payments i think jeremy you were touching upon that also Absolutely. um but it's decreasing value to the migrant right because the broker gets commission so so it's it's all along those moments in, in the payment mechanism where honestly regulations are either in a gray area and it depends on the agility. And I would say that the biggest of the regulatory hurdles are more with regards to better protecting at home than at host. Yeah. No, uh, I, I must admit, yes, this host uh, uh, issue is, is definitely a big issue. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult to tackle. So uh, thank you so much, Garance. And with this, Brian, you have the last word on this panel. And uh, in particular, if you could focus on two points, which is one, the development and implementation of insurance for migrants. And uh, you have a lot of experience in the Philippines. And as a second point, really this home host, uh, yeah, complexity and whether there could harmonization could be possible and could help. Okay, uh, perhaps the, well, one of the main issues in so far as uh, doing business of insurance is the commercial presence required for each particular host country. Uh, the issue arises in view of uh, different laws presently for the country of origin and various countries of destination. Um, 
for us, we require that uh, for a certain uh, for an insurance company to do um, whenever they would want to do or engage in the business of insurance in our country, they have to, to establish their commercial presence, meaning uh, they have to be registered and secure a certificate of authority from the insurance commission. I can safely assume that uh, this is the same case for other jurisdictions, considering that uh, they need to have uh, those insurance company come within the ambit of their jurisdiction for purposes of um, regulating them for the timely and efficient delivery of service intended for the convenience of the consuming public. Another factor is the difference in dynamics existing before our each country, such as culture, physical, and social environment among others. This is not to say, however, that there are no solutions. Um, there could be a recipro reciprocity clauses introduced in our um, respective um, laws. That way, um, whatever authority or privilege provided to domestically registered entities in a host country can likewise be extended to foreign entities provided that the latter's country of origin provides the same accommodation. Another possible avenue would be having a bilateral or multilateral agreements between countries for purposes of having common standards or principles in addressing the concerns of migrant workers. With this, uh, participating countries will have basis on what laws, measures, or policies are needed to be enacted enacted in their respective jurisdiction. Insofar as the development of products are concerned, as I have mentioned a while ago, there are pending measures before our legislative department in order to enhance or expand the coverage. Uh, as we have it right now, we only cover agency hired employees. So there's a proposal to include um, all overseas Filipino workers, be it agency hired or not meaning the balik manggagawas, the direct hires, and name hires. And then it also seeks to expand the coverage on benefits to include repatriation due to civil war, natural calamities and pandemic, health insurance, disablement, which are psychological in nature, among others. Let me note, however, that this proposed measures intended to imply equally for both uh, men and women. So. Uh, but uh, we are gearing towards the uh, gender sensitivity based benefits, especially the uh, concerns that need to be addressed in so far as our women migrant workers are concerned. Thank you. No, Brian, Brian, thank you so much. And in particular, also raising again uh, the uh, issue of the sensitivity to women uh, workers. So I think with this, we are at the end of the panel. Uh, William, we will definitely give you the word, but if we could please now address two questions that we have already in the chat, if this is okay for you, William. Um, so because there is one question on, um, on illegal immigrants. So uh, yeah, that is a very difficult question. And then there was another one on health insurance where uh, the employer is supposed to pay but then passes it on to the immigrant yeah um uh, where uh, there was also the question what can we do about this um who from the panel would like to take these questions okay legal honestly i yeah it's difficult don't know what to answer on that to be yeah. honest uh, is it except that uh it's 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 linked to this mandatory versus non-mandatory right approach the mandatory approach is, is 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 probably the best one but then you're not addressing the uh, the illegal workers and then maybe the best way there is to be going through uh these intermediaries that we've been mentioning which is not the money transfer operators but the the, the fintechs and and uh, because less data is requested there but i don't really have an answer to that but on the health one um yes it's often passed on <laughs> to, to 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 the to the to the worker right be it a contingent worker or even a salaried worker be it a construction worker who is only um who is only uh, uh recruited project by project right or even uh workers that are that are employed with a contract i think a lot has to do uh and this came as a surprise to me but with the amount to be covered if we started with very simple basic needs which is 
hospitalization, for example, mm -hmm. and if it was, let's say, $100 a year, I'm just taking random numbers, and not 500 because today a lot of the mandatory situations, and here I'm just taking UAE and I've come across a few contracts, it's not maybe the case everywhere, but it's very, it's much bigger amounts than just, so by definition, the employers are trying to go around it. It's more complex and it's if we make it hospitalization, so inpatient to start with, or inpatient and personal accident, just to start with, with much lower amounts, $8 a month, $10 a month, this would probably make the employer want to push it less to the employee to pay. And then there's a question of cross-selling for more relevant subgroups, domestic workers, drivers, construction workers, where there we can progressively increase instead of making it a big mandatory package, which is systematically pushed on to, uh, to the migrant. Uh, I don't know, Jeremy, Brian, do you also want, and by the way, uh, excuse me, it was not illegal uh, immigrants, so in the chat. Uh, undocumented, uh, no, you meant undocumented? Uh, absolutely, undocumented. Yeah. I, I just took the questions absolutely from uh, from the chat, but it's undocumented, and that will then, of course, also have some, some implications, yeah, because you won't have an ID, uh, you won't have... Yeah, uh, data, as you have said it, Garance. But uh, Brian, uh, Jeremy, do you want uh, to come in also on these two uh, uh, points before, Janina, uh, we move to, um, I think, one or two other questions in the chat? Maybe uh, just on document, I guess the question is whether they're completely undocumented, they have no, no form of identity, or they only have identity from the original home country before migration. And I think from our side, for th these, these are basically low sum insured kind of policies. From a risk based perspective, they are low risk. I think insurers should be kind of comfortable that, you know, that as long as there's some form of identity that matches them to, to demonstrate that they are the intended kind of um, beneficiary or cover, then we should be open to that. I know the challenge is, you know, if you hold it strictly, you know, you often want to be, um, you know, the, the kind of national, the, the insurers are essentially being the outsourced kind of home affairs and kind of verifying whether the person is living in the country, where the reality is someone's kind of paying premium, they're getting cover, um, and they have are able to prove their identity and confirm that they are under cover of that particular policy. And again, from a risk-based thing, it's it's highly unlikely to be um, kind of money laundering and uh, kind of financing of terrorism. So again, from a risk-based perspective, we should be kind of more comfortable with that, whether that's silent or not. Yeah. So I think that's kind of one one aspect. I think there's a maybe I jump in on that kind of question around bundling with insurance with other well-known insurance products. Absolutely. I mean. Um, I think that's, I think what's been seen is there's quite a lot of innovation around including a range of different insurance products with the remittance kind of offering, if that's what, you, what you're referring to. I mean, we mm -hmm. haven't done the remittance yet, but we've got a model where we're looking kind of MSME cover. And again, mm -hmm. I think in the cross-border in Africa, you can see quite a lot of the um, uh, rem the remittances are, are supporting small business, kind of small businesses, even kind of individual owners or small businesses. And you could start adding other risk covers to help address their, their requirements. So yes, absolutely. And I'm not sure so much that, I guess the regulatory issues always do come in, but I think it's more about responding to the, the need of the, um, of, the, of the market and the demands that they, the migrants are, are or the, the remittance providers are, um, are having to make. Yeah, no, no, thank you. We got additional information on the undocumented. Yeah, undocumented doesn't mean, mean necessarily that you don't have an ID. You're just not registered with your domicile in the US. So this is uh, what I uh, what I understood after the exchange in the chat. Uh, Janina, do we have additional questions? I'm just trying to catch up because... Yeah, there's... <laughs> Thanks, Manuel. And I, I mean, there's quite some activity in the chat, and I, uh, I already need to apologize um, since we are, we've already run out of time. And I know that we also uh -huh. wanted to turn to premises and William again for, um, uh, for a few um, uh, yeah. remarks. I just wanted to pick up one question, um, and that was about um, long-term perspectives. Um, sort of the question that um, migrants would probably stay in, in a country. Um, for, for a longer time. And uh, the question was about ways of um, FSPs to ensure retention in insurance and pension schemes. So do you have any, any thoughts of, around that? I don't know, Jeremy, go on, so Brian. Perhaps I, I, mean, honest, yeah, I don't want to launch my, I don't, I don't know enough, Jeremy. I think on the pension one, probably William is, best placed on the on the pension one specifically if I understand it correctly anyway uh, on my end uh, perhaps on the uh, in the Philippines um, 
pension side is more or less covered because um, overseas Filipino workers are um, can uh, avail the pension benefits pr uh, we have here for private uh, employees, provided that these OFWs duly register and uh, regularly pay their contribution. So if and when they decide to return and retire in the Philippines, they have uh, something to look forward or something to assist them in terms uh, in time of uh, retirement here in the Philippines. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay, so in the interest of time, um, and uh, again, apologies for for um, for running over a bit, but I hope people have another uh, maybe five minutes to to stay with us, because um, I would. Uh, well, first of all, thank like to thank uh, Manuela and the and the panel for for the great discussion. I think, as you can see, it provokes a lot of uh, a lot of reactions in the chat, and there's certainly a lot that we can um, that we can discuss about this topic. Uh, William, just to quickly uh, go back to you and see if you have any particular comments on on what's been said in the panel before we turn to premises. I'll be super brief and hand over to premises. Just two quick things. One is thanks to Garons for mentioning the gender, which is a big focus. Don't have time to do it now, but um, that's a really important point to make. And on the pension one that people mentioned, the critical thing here really is that there's a single account and then you can make micro payments from lots of different places. Mexico's done some really great work in terms of how you can you know, go to a 7-Eleven and make a small dollar contribution it only works if you've got low cost payments into a unique account and then you can have any number of outlets be there for one year three months come back 17 different times but it's always aggregating in the single one and um, but let me stop there and i'll hand over to yeah. you all to you and then to premises yeah and i can only confirm what william is saying yeah so you need a single account and not hundreds of very small pots yeah and i know this is a challenge for regulators in particular cross-border but please uh, um janina back Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you. premises. Uh, I'd like to hand over to you for some uh, well, concluding remarks uh, and some points you'd like to make. Thanks, Janina. Uh, I think what we have heard today is that the importance of migrant financial resilience and migrant insurance and pension is increasing. Uh, it's not 300 million migrants and their families. Uh, the lifeline depends on remittance and if uh, from the migrants. And if something happens on the health side or disability side, um, the, the families are again falling back to previous levels of inequality, inequality, debt burden, poverty, etc. And it's not a hypothetical situation. Uh, every minute one migrant dies due to workplace injuries, which means that by the time we have ended this, I mean, I'm not sounding dystopian, but by the time we have spent here in the webinar, close to 100 migrants have died due to workplace injuries, which shows the rate at which migrant families are falling into uh, the risk of uh, fin financial vulnerability. And therefore, uh, the initiatives on migrant insurance need to be given much more focus on developing. And we have heard some challenges, some real life challenges in terms of the regulation, for example, the cross-border aspects of such insurance and pension schemes in terms of not only the payments, of contribution and claim and uh, benefits, but also in terms of data uh, and documentation challenges, the host country and home country uh, bilateral agreements or the absence of it. Uh, we have also heard about some of the regulatory challenges around the channels and the clarity about which kind of insurance may work uh, for the migrants, the KYC requirements, uh, et cetera. And also on the institutional side, we have, we have heard today uh, the, the need for not only designing uh, products, but also how do we align our business model and the distribution channels, how the incentives need to be aligned so that the sustainability and continuity of such programs are there. Uh, I think uh, it was it is very well put that not all channels fit to all kinds of products. Um, and, and therefore the market maturity uh, in terms of not only insurance companies and pension providers, but also in terms of the distribution providers is, is very much functional to how and whether this migrant insurance products will work. In terms of the product development, are we putting enough effort in terms of understanding the needs of the migrants is, is a core question. Uh, whether uh, 
whether the simple, not only simple, I will not use the word simple, but intuitive understanding of migrants need is there uh, in terms of designing our solutions, whether we are communicating our migrant insurance products and uh, uh, benefits to them through insurance literacy and pension literacy programs. These are the questions that we kind of need to jointly answer as we move forward. I think uh, just to highlight that at, at Indian CDF, while we are nudging this, trying to nudge this market of migrant insurance and pension, uh, we'll be working uh, for the next, uh, with, with all of you actually, uh, on the ecosystem level through understanding the market, understanding regulations, in ensuring public private dialogue take place, more of, more of such occasions happen so that those confusions and clarities are obtained. We would be working on capacity building of the institutions to design the business models which address some of the problems that has been highlighted, some of the challenges that has been highlighted in terms of incentive alignment and business model. And of course, we would be working at the product level also to work on the human centric design aspects, the process level efficiency aspects, uh, incentive alignment aspects, and also uh, ensuring uh, insurance and pension literacy ultimately leads to empowerment of the migrants and their families. Uh, with that and the interest of time, would be uh, would be uh, concluding, but a big thanks to all the participants and especially to the panelists and uh, and and William, of course, and A2II. So so we have been it's it's been a journey. We have been A2II and us and IEIS have been planning for this event for quite some time, and we are very happy to have such a lively and uh, good participation and discussion. Over to you, Anila. Thanks, Premises, for for this excellent summary of the of the discussion. And I agree that um, yeah, it was uh, it was great. Um, very interesting questions.